Late 70s, few people had doubts that uh, Karpov Kasparov match would be inevitable. Uh, and I think Karp also was aware that while he was concentrating on Viktor Korchnoi and, and uh, they wanted, you know, to play as many matches as possible because it was not just, you know, a chess event, but it's the very important ideological battle that could bring him more favors from the state. Uh, they kept an eye on me and um, um, I also sensed that, you know, I would be a natural challenger. But uh, there were many obstacles on the way, and uh, not last, that's, you know, I, uh, I was a um, half Armenian, half Jewish boy from Baku, facing uh, a Russian champion and, and a darling of the system. Um, though I, you know, I, uh, uh, I benefited from the patronage of the local party boss, uh, Heider Aliyev, who just, you know, offered me full support to create a base uh, of a preparation that was not dependent on favors of the central authorities. Um, I still knew that, you know, it would not be an easy, easy challenge. And, um, and Karpov had, had a little appetite of playing against me. Uh, but in 1981, so we, we met in, uh, in the tournament that was organized, you know, t t at the time of the 20, 26 Party Congress, Communist Party Congress in Moscow is four teams. The first team led by Karpov, uh, the veteran team led by um, Vasily Smyslov, and the second team led by Lech Romanishin and, uh, and the junior team. Um, and uh, there was a little intrigue there just to make sure I would not be at board one. And there were two worthy uh, contenders for the board one, Artur Yusupov and Lev Psachis. But it ended up so after vote after vote was held among our players, so that I ended up at board one. Everybody wanted to see me playing playing Karpov. Um, and uh, in 1980 we had first uh, encounter. So uh, in in January we um, we were part uh, of the same team. So of course Karpov was board one, and I was a second reserve uh, uh, in European Championship. But there were two ten players there, and it was quite an easy walk for the Soviet team, though Karpov played quite poorly, and it's because the very good results by, you know, by the end, by, by, by the tail of the team, uh, where, you know, it's uh, Artur Yusupov made three and, uh, and half out of four, and made five and a half out of six, and some other players like Ramonishin and Vaganian also made great scores, so that's where we, we won handily. Um, and my interaction was minimal. In Malta, the Chess Olympiad was different. It was very close, very the closest possible race, and uh, we won, you know, almost almost by miracle at the very end, on, on a tie break, uh, beating Hungarian team. And there were only, only six players, and uh, we interacted more. And uh, again, I could feel that they were watching me, and uh, um, and I actually I also watched Carpo, but n naturally they they learn more by just you know analyzing the way I played and just you know looking for any any kind of psychological uh, weaknesses and. And I believe that over years, you know, using all the data from the medical research, which you know, all Soviet players, um, uh, chess players, or just any athletes had to go through, so they, they, they collected enough data to, to um, empower Karpov and his team just to meet me um, uh, fully armed when we met in the World Championship match in 1984. Going back to 1981, so there were two games, and um, at board one, uh, both ended as a draw, so I... Um, I was very close to winning game one, uh, but um, I was not ready to, to overcome Karpov's resilience and his stubborn defense. Uh, and uh, uh, game two, um, it was Karpov tried hard, but the game never left the, the territory of equality. So there were two draws, but uh, I actually won board <laughs> competition on board one because I made plus two and Karpov made only plus one. Um, and then another game we played was in Moscow. It was the um, Moscow International Tournament. Karpov played well, he won it, plus five. And we played in the last round, I played white, but I was already trailing him by one and a half points and uh, um, the game was a short draw. But then I think Karpov made a sort of a very uh, rational decision from his perspective, not to play against me at all. And uh, it was quite difficult for me to find, you know, Stronger national tournaments because Karpov you know, wanted to play everywhere. But what's happened is that you know we were separated. Uh, Karpov played in, in most of the tournaments, and I had my own uh, uh, 
re, uh, uh, diet of, uh, of chess events outside of the Soviet Union, but we never, we never played a single game. So we, we played in the same team in 1984 in the Russia-Soviet Union against the rest of the world. He played board one against Wolf Anderson, I played board two against Jan Timon. And then we met in, um, in uh, 1994 in the match. One more moment that's probably worth mentioning though, again, it just could go forever if I start uh, uh, rec uh, recalling all the details. In 1983, where, um, when I was a victim of the, of the intrigue try that uh, tried to remove me from the candidate uh, uh, cycle, uh, Soviet Union was already uh, on the way of boycotting Olympiad in 1984 in Los Angeles. And uh, um, new FIDE president, Florencio Campomanes, just playing the ball with the Soviets, announced that our match with Korshin would be in Pasadena. So though I, you know, I, um, I chose Rotterdam and uh, Las Palmas and Rotterdam, Korshin chose only Rotterdam, and uh, Campomanes said, oh, uh, you know, Kasparov put Las Palmas first, of course it was not me and the Soviets. Soviet authorities, Karkorsi, Rotterdam, so we have to go to Pasadena. And so, wait a second, why, why I'm not against playing Rotterdam? No, 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 I don't want anyone to have an advantage. So Pasadena, basically, I could go there, you know, I was, you know, it's, it was, um, uh, I lost the match by default, by not showing up. And, uh, and if, not, uh, if not for, uh, for um, Alif's interference, who became a member of Politburo at the time, uh, it's, it's, it, would, uh, it would end up as, as just, you know, disaster. They just clearly wanted me to be removed from the cycle and Karpov uh, was willing, more than willing to play the third match with Viktor Korchnoi. And I met him a few times there and uh, I realized that, you know, that he, he had been playing games and everything he told me just, you know, it was, was, not, uh, was not true because it's the behind my back, they just tried to make sure that I would, I would be out of the competition. Okay, I survived. So just they brought me back. I played the match with Korchino. I beat the Korchino. I beat Smyslov. I, I played Karpov, uh, yeah, and um, and that's that was the beginning of this long, long relations. Um, um, though again, despite everything I said, you know, just it's when I met Karpov at at the board in Moscow in September 1994, I knew very little about about him. I knew very little about. Uh, you know, that all the difficulties that I would uh, have to encounter by trying to beat him. Hello there. <clears throat> and uh, as usual, uh, uh, <laughs> hopefully you can hear me and see me. I never entirely know if things will work the way they're supposed to work. Um, but hopefully... Uh, hopefully, uh, the settings haven't really gone completely astray in the meantime. So, uh, this is my, uh, it's been a while since I streamed, uh, since I streamed on this channel. And obviously with the timing, uh, of this stream, uh, the main topic of the day, of course, has to be, uh, the world championship match that starts tomorrow. So, uh, the plan for today's stream uh is we probably should have some kind of a chat I'm, I'm i'm sure you probably have some questions uh regarding the the world championship match and then the usual formula i will with the help of chat and i'm really not kidding about that i've uh, you know over the course of these streams i've been bailed out by chat more than once when when solving we will solve some puzzles uh i have some puzzles prepared and i've been staring at diagram one of the, the puzzle series one that we will be solving later. And, uh, they seem, uh, difficult today. So, uh, that's going to be, uh, that's, that's going to be quite, uh, quite the challenge. And, uh, and then I'll play, uh, the, the, the users on, on the Kasparov chess website. We will get to the, to the whole how to challenge me on Kasparov chess thing a bit later because that comes in the second half of the show, definitely past the one hour mark. Uh, but for now, yeah, we should probably, you know, address the, address the most important, uh, you know, chess topic of, uh, of the day, the week, the month, and, you know, arguably the year. And I think the, the video we, we have all just watched is sort of very much on point there because, uh, 
obviously when you talk about war, world championship matches very few people uh in history of chess have as much experience playing world championship matches as as Garry Kasparov I I would probably venture to say that nobody really equals him in terms of uh the you know just the sheer volume of world championship matches will will be you know it's difficult to rival and uh uh as has been announced uh, earlier today Gary uh with the help of Matthew Sadler will be doing um after shows after I think every single game of the world championship match they will be yeah I, I was thinking about Lasker but I think Gary probably comes ahead because I think Lasker played um well obviously Steinitz and then a couple against Bogolubov and one against Kappa right that's my count so that's and one against uh Schlechter. So that's maybe six. And I think Gary definitely played more than six over the course of his career. Uh I could be wrong. I probably, you know, if I if I want to mention some kind of stats like this, you you know, it makes sense to actually prepare. And I didn't, so it, it it's very possible that I'm wrong on this count. But uh, I think Gary's first, Lasker's probably second, and Magnus is actually catching up. I think it's Magnus's fifth uh, title match, which is uh, a very, very large number considering how young he still is. Um, and uh, shows really no particular signs of, you know, slowing down, even though I haven't seen the press conference in its entirety, but from some of the tidbits, uh, some of the tidbits that uh, I've seen, like the quotes I've seen from the press conferences that both he and Jan gave uh, yesterday, uh, Magnus himself is very open uh, on the topic of relative, obviously all of these things are very relative, but sort of relative, uh, maybe not lack of hunger, I think that's going to be a huge overstatement, but he 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 talked about being less hungry for you, for you know for the glory of the world championship match than he has had let's say in 2013, and I think that's extremely understandable because you know whenever you win anything for the first time, that's the one that sticks, that's the one that you remember the most, and that's the one that excites you the most. And uh, uh, I think it's very very understandable that you know. He can't really get himself to the level of, you know, excitement and elation and uh, anticipation that he felt then. But he still is going very strong. And on the other side of it is is Jan Nipomnishi, who is um, a very interesting uh, uh, challenger, I think, for Magnus. Because uh, Magnus, obviously... and. It's something I will get to the concrete concrete questions uh, uh, in a bit, but something I wanted to point out is uh, how much of a good interview Magnus has become over the years. Because I think, you know, early on in his career, he was very much a master of you know monosyllabic answers to most questions, and uh, these days he gives absolutely unbelievable interviews in terms of just how open he is about all kinds of aspects of his career and chess life and his approach to things. And he's also very much not above, you know, firing shots and trying to establish some sort of, you know, early score, some early points. So he said that uh, he still feels that Ding of Fabi were his uh, most difficult challenges when he looks at the field of the candidates that Jan won. And he still feels that, even though Jan did win the candidates quite convincingly. Uh, which is an interesting thing to say when you are playing a world championship match against somebody, uh, somebody not in that list. But uh, you, the one thing that you absolutely have to say about, uh, about Jan is that uh, because of the whole dynamic of you know Jan having a positive score against him and also they used to be um, they used to be on very, very friendly terms. I, I hesitate, like, calling two people, neither of whom are me, uh, friends is like, it's not my place to call them friends, but they were, 
definitely on very good terms. They work on chess, worked on chess together at some point. So I think this also factors into it. And, uh, uh, Jan, I think among the, uh, the, the, the current world elite is probably the person who is, uh, least afraid of playing Magnus. And I think genuinely believes he can, you know, beat him in any given game or in, in any given event. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, people have mentioned this in interviews. I think, uh, Vichy said something along those lines. And I think also Judith, when, when interviewed about the match, she, she said something uh, along those lines as well, that it's extremely important <clears throat> when playing, uh, you know, high level competitions. I'm, I'm guessing in every game, but in chess, I do know it to be extremely true for myself. Uh, that feeling that you think about the game you're about to play and you, you feel that if you win that game, it will be completely normal. You are sort of expecting to win, maybe not every game, but at least some games. And you have this, there is no mental block in your mind when you're playing a certain player and you think, how am I going to win a single game against this player? And Jan definitely will not have that, uh, which is extremely useful when playing uh, somebody like like Magnus, who has been dominant over over the chess scene for, well, arguably the last 10 years. He has been world champion since 2013, but he was world, I think he became world number one somewhere around late 2010, I want to say. Uh, so being unafraid and feeling that you definitely can, can and perhaps even, you know, in your mind should win is, is a huge bonus. Uh, so that's sort of my, my interest. So now I'll, I'll try to, to get to some of the questions. First of all, are you commentating tomorrow? I am commentating tomorrow, but not on this channel. You can, uh, uh, take a look. I, I, like, I shouldn't really be promoting other channels on this channel, but it's a direct question. Like, check my Twitter. Well, I am, I am doing some commentary on the match. Yes. Uh, people pointing out that Lasker, was world champion for 27 years. Yeah. And in terms of length of time uh, for keeping the crown, it's, it's really, really remarkable, but he didn't play, you know, very many title matches in that span. Uh, so, uh, it's, uh, it's still a, f a very, very impressive, uh, factoid, but I don't know. Uh, I don't know if, if that's very relevant. Uh, do you think there's going to be a Grunfeld? It's an interesting question, uh, and also how many Berlins. Like, the, the question of, uh, what the openings will look like. We will start getting a much clearer picture tomorrow. Um, but, um, I think, uh, I mean, I wouldn't really expect very many Berlins. Let's put it like this. I think, uh, Jan probably wants, Jan probably wants to play as open a match as possible. I think it makes great sense for him to, you know, considering his own strengths and weaknesses. And he is a very, very good technical player. I think people kind of underrate him as a, as a technical player just because of how mercurial he is and how, uh, you, you know, at his, at his best. And when he's really flying, he, you know, I think his main strength is still sort of creating mayhem and, uh, uh you know, exploiting mayhem, uh, because he just calculates faster and more precisely and just feels the, the dynamics better than, than most of his opponents. But I think in particular against Magnus, it, it definitely, in my opinion, should make sense for him to, uh, to try and aim for as sort of open, a battle as as possible maybe not from game 1 because obviously uh once again i like i i really hate all of this you know diagnosis by user peak type of uh punditry but uh judging by the pictures of that press conference there is a lot of tension there and it would be extremely surprising if there wasn't uh, because, I mean, it's a, it's a world championship match and they were giving a press conference two days out. So, of course, their mind is very much already on game one and, uh, uh, there should be some tension. But I think, 
uh, because of that. And Jan really hasn't played tournament chess for a while, and he shouldn't really have been playing tournament. I mean, I think like the last two months are generally accepted to be preparation time. Uh, I think it kind of makes sense for game one to, you know, quote unquote, play yourself in. But in general, it's a 14 game match, which is reasonably long. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, I would expect him to go for, you know, very open play. And, uh, Berlin, in my mind, is, is not, you know, it's not really fitting my definition of very open play. Yeah, 14 move, 14 move Berlin draws are not allowed by rules. I don't think you can find a three, four, I mean, unless you count queen e4, queen d4, which will not happen. Uh, the rules of the match, uh, I think prohibit draw first and, uh, before move 40, I'm pretty sure. I think I read that on the website. So yeah, we're not going to get very many short draws at all. Um, uh, there were some questions about Alirez. Obviously, if there was not a world championship match going on, uh, or starting soon, we would be talking about Alireza, of course, making it to 2800 at the age of 17 and destroying fields and uh, clearly kind of staking a claim for perhaps being a favorite in the forthcoming candidates. And yeah, Alireza is fantastic. And uh, on any other day, I think we could be talking about Alireza forever. But there is a world championship match starting uh, starting tomorrow. So Alireza kind of takes a backseat to that, but obviously both the Grand Suisse and then what he did for France in the European teams is uh, uh, sort of staggeringly good. Um, any clues about Nepo's strategy in the match? Does Magnus have any weaknesses he can target? Uh, Magnus, I think, is one of the better all-round players in the world. Maybe in the history of the game, he is very, very good at calculating, and also obviously just as, let's say, Kramnik and Vichy, both of them were saying in the run-up to uh, to the to the match that his positional understanding, his general sort of feeling for where the pieces belong is second to absolutely none in the history of chess. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't think he has any any weaknesses you can pinpoint. The, the, the weakness sort of is what I mentioned very early on. 20, 2020 and 2021 were not his best years. I think he will be the first one to admit that he kind of took took his foot off the gas a little bit and uh, he hasn't really been playing anywhere near his best. Uh, but that's not, you know, that's not a stylistic problem you can target. It's just that it's just that you know he hasn't been he hasn't been uh, uh, playing his A game and uh, uh, for him not playing his A game I think Jan is an incredibly dangerous opponent because as I mentioned Jan is very very unafraid and Jan will bounce if uh, if Magnus doesn't play well but uh, we'll have to see. Um, Uh, who do you think is Magnus' second? I don't know. I have absolutely no insight on uh, who the seconds are. They were asked during the press conference, and uh, Magnus said, basically, I'm not telling. And, uh, I mean, Peter Heine Nielsen was in some pictures, so he clearly is in Dubai, unsurprisingly, has been uh, Magnus' main, uh, main man for a while. Uh, and, yeah, that, that list, that one puzzle piece is suggesting is I think it's a kind of a you are I don't I don't think you know I think you're guessing and it's a decent guess but I think some of, some of those names on the list probably will turn out to be incorrect but that's a list of people who have been sort of around Magnus for a while and yeah not unreasonable but I don't think it will uh it will be entire uh, this list entirely we'll see and 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 Jan said that the same-ish people who helped him for the candidates were helping him again. So that, you know, you can go back to the news articles about the candidates and uh, and see what he said then uh, and sort of that will give you some idea of what the list might be on, on Jan's side. I am not involved in uh, in any way. 
Yeah, that's also, yeah, that kind of makes me much happier about your prediction, uh, for Magnus's candidates because, uh, seconds, because yeah, that, that's not really an actual list. Uh, one puzzle piece. That, that list is just flat out wrong. <laughs> so I'm, uh, kind of, kind of happier with my uh, original prediction of you just guessing. Uh, um, anyway, um, I will continue answering questions. Uh, I will continue answering questions as we go, but let's also maybe put put a chessboard on screen uh, on screen here and start talking about uh, chess tactics. Um, would it be considered treason if a Russian was second for Magnus this match? It would be kind of weird. Treason, no, but I think uh, seconding uh, seconding uh, Magnus against your your countrymen would be like. With no political, uh, you know, hot issues to, to, to talk about. Just would just generally be kind of weird. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, I will, I will continue taking, uh, taking questions from chat, but for now, let me, uh, switch to a different scene and, uh, uh, the usual preface, uh, kasparovchess.com is, uh, is a website which provides all kinds of uh, all kinds of uh, interactive services for uh, for people who want to improve their chess, from uh, documentaries and uh, uh, interviews and uh, things of that nature, to a very very large uh, library of uh, lessons from uh, various strong players. And for today, we will start by. Um, a series by uh, Anisha's uh, uh, better half, uh, Sopiko Goramishvili. Uh, the series is, and uh, I see now people are challenging me, challenging me on the website. Uh, one particular feature of Kasparov, uh, Kasparov Chess as a website is that uh, the challenge actually times itself out if it's not accepted uh, after, I think, either 15 or 30 seconds. And... Uh, I don't see the raid yet, but oh uh, yeah, now I see it. Yeah. Uh hi Arthur, and thank you very much. Uh thank you very much for the raid and uh it was nice uh nice being in Riga and uh and, and seeing you there. I because of how generally weird uh you know the, the situation with the bio bubble in Riga was, we didn't really get to talk very much. But yeah, thank you for the raid and it's uh it's always nice to visit Riga. My my family parts of my family spent Spent a long, long time in Riga, and uh, the, the place has always been kind of dear to my heart. And uh, welcome to all of Arthur's viewers. Thank you very much for uh, for the raid. Um, so yeah, this is a Sopika series called "Attacking the Castled King," and uh, uh, expert level, uh, expert level. Uh, at some point, I think. Uh, the other admins, uh, explained, I think, in chat, sort of general rules for sort of what puzzle level is corresponding to, to what, uh, actual rating. But I don't really remember <laughs> what the numbers were, so I can't really help you there very much. Uh, but this is, I've been, as, as I mentioned, I've been, because I prepared this scene, I've had this position on my screen for a while now. And it's difficult. I'm not entirely sure what the answer is. I will play uh, uh, against uh, users on, on Kasparov Chess after we've done a couple of series of puzzles. Not right now. Yeah. As I mentioned, the challenges do time out. And uh, until we come to the point in the, in the show where I will start taking challenges, it really is kind of uh, an exercise in futility to send me a challenge right this moment. And yeah, there we, there we have... <clears throat> Uh, some, some people with actual knowledge. So expert is sort of between 2000 and uh, 2200 and master is, uh, even above that. Um, uh, so let's take a look at this position while, and, and yeah, I will, I will continue. Uh, first of all, I will probably need your help with, with the solving. And secondly, if there is something you still want to talk about concerning the match or really anything at all, 
uh, please continue asking me uh, asking me in chat. I do have both both chats open, both Twitch and YouTube, and uh, um, I will try to get. Th do you agree with the current format of the World Chess Championship? Um, I think the answer to that is it's a kind of a boring answer, but it's the answer I. Um, like, I genuinely think that. I think it's really much less important what the format is. And you have to understand that, like, um, what I'm saying here is definitely from my perspective as a professional player of long standing. I'm not saying this as a viewer. I'm not saying this as a chess fan, which I also very much am. I'm saying this as a player. For me, as a player, the biggest thing always has been that the format needs to be well understood, announced in advance, and not changed. Because there was definitely a period in, in the FIDA, in the FIDA history where they just chopped and changed the, the format for everything, seemingly like on a whim every, <laughs> I mean, not every two weeks or so, but like every half a year. And, uh, that led to a lot of unhappiness, obviously. But as long as everybody really understands what they should be shooting for, like what the targets are, what the, how, how the qualification system works, I don't think it matters a great deal, let's say, what the final format for the title match is. I really don't think that. And yeah, let's get to, let's get to solving for a bit. Uh, thank you very much for, for the gift, uh, Monsopied. Have you spoken to Jan recently? We're, we're in touch, but he is busy right now. I'm, I'm definitely not, uh, going to be messaging him during the, the world championship match. If he, if he decides to message me, I'm, I'm always happy to talk to him, but, uh, I would expect, like, if he has any sense at all, he will probably uninstall all the, all of the messengers and, like, cut himself off completely from people who are not absolutely central to what he's trying to achieve. At least that would be my advice to him. Just like stop talking to random idiots like myself and just, you know, concentrate on what's in front of you because that's kind of important. Um, okay. So, uh, the, the theme here, as I, as I said, yeah, I, I've seen this question already and I probably should answer it. I like, I generally don't like people spamming the same question over and over again. Please, if you can, don't do that. But, uh, your question, Shark77, uh, if you, if you actually premium, you have access to everything. So you don't actually have to choose. Uh, so you probably should choose like the subjects that interest you. It's not really about the pros as much as like what you think you need to improve, what you think is the theme that interests you and try to find, you know, material on the site which addresses those particular points. Because I think the choice is very wide on the website and very, very stellar. There is, you know, close to a, a, a thousand lessons already. So it's just a question of just diving in and enjoying it. Anyway, yeah, I, I, I really do need to start solving at some point. Uh, uh, and as the text on, on the right side here says, why delayed castling to start an early attack? And yes, we do see the king on e1 and the uh, white pushing for, uh, for, for the open h file here. It actually kind of looks like a Grunfeld. I'm not entirely sure of what kind of a line of the Grunfeld can lead to a position like this, but it looks like a Grunfeld to me. Uh, and I will say it looks like a Grunfeld which hasn't really gone very well for black at all. Uh, because there is still all of these pieces which aren't really participating in the defense. And, uh, the king side is looking a little bit bare. But, uh, I, on the other hand, if you make a couple of slow moves and allow black, I don't know, if, in particular, like if you take on a6, I'm not going to be making any moves on the board because, uh, that will mean that I failed the puzzle. But if you, let's say, if you take on a6, black takes on a6, and I can come to c5, the rooks can start coming to the center. And, uh, uh, this way you can lose all of your initiative. So you need to be very fast. And I think, like, the, the, the early important theme here is just not letting black breathe at all. Being 
sort of as forceful as possible, as for, for as long as possible, to just make sure that Black does not get any time at all to, you know, catch a breath and, and start defending. And there is already a very good sequence uh, suggested by Shiri Shirov in, uh, 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 in chat, which I think is the right approach. But I have some questions. Not, not the I mean, the line is correct, but I think there are better tries by Black along the way. And many people have already pointed out that if you play h5 here, it does allow queen takes g5, which looks kind of bad. So, and to the question, will you ever stream? I streamed yesterday, roller coaster. So, uh, will you ever watch it? I think is a bigger question here. Um, so I think starting with e6 makes a lot of sense because we activate our queen. Let's briefly talk about what happens if black takes. Uh, if black takes, I think the point is we can play bishop g4, and there is really no comfortable way for black to protect this pawn on c e6, because if you play bishop c8, um, we can simply take on c8 and then take on e6 with the bishop, and we uh, we break through and win. So f6, I think, is the best move. And now I will agree with Sherry Sherry, and I think we should be playing h5. We Once again, we cannot pause here. We cannot make any kind of a waiting move. We need to be extremely fast. So we go h5. And yeah, this is the problem, because the engine actually goes after hg5, which I think is a bad move. And the issue <clears throat> the issue I've had with this solution, I, I kind of assumed this was the correct solution. Uh, my, my issue is I don't know how, how you refute bishop takes e2. I think in the practical game, uh, black should be taking on e2 here, we take on g6, and black just takes on g6 themselves. And I assume the problem is that once the h file is open, we can just simply take on e2 with the king, and then proceed to give mate on the king side. But I think fg5 just loses faster. So I think it's incorrect, but uh, it's also simpler to explain. Now we take on g6, of course, and after queen f6, uh, I think there is more than one solution, but the one I like, yeah, I think we probably should do it this way. I think the immediate e7 wins. Ah, oh, no, hang on a second. F2 is hanging with check, so I shouldn't be playing f7, e7 here. We go gh, and then we go e7. Now that the queen is pinned along the long diagonal, uh, we can play uh, e7, and we win a lot of material here because we are threatening ef. This is impossible, and if black takes on b2, of course, we can take on f8 with an immediate win. Is there a knight f7 after hg, hg? Um, yeah, the issue is I can't really show those lines. So bishop e2, hg, hg. Knight f7, I think the issue is queen takes a6. <clears throat> Probably the biggest issue. There is also bishop h5. So it's a bit messy, and I think um, it's a better chance in a practical game. Uh, but yeah, this is a kind of a cute, uh, cute final position, and uh, this is puzzle one in the bag. There is a long question there. Uh, would you say that World Championship match is not an appropriate format to find out the best player in the world because it tests your preparation and physical strength rather than chess strength? Um, no, not really. I don't think so. I think... Um, uh, I think... Uh, you know, the World Championship match is a culmination of a very, very long cycle. So, in order to get there, you you have to, you know, demonstrate dominance over more than one format. You have to win, like, you have to get to the candidates somehow, and then you have to win the candidates. And uh, I sort of understand what you're saying about, you know, Jan beating Magnus and people still thinking Magnus is, like, in the tournament, Magnus will be the more feared player. But that, I don't think that invalidates... The world championship match in any way uh and um yeah i generally just uh, there has to be a way to determine the world champion and as i said i i don't think it matters greatly what the system is but also the the match as it has been for you know for the vast majority of chess chess history is a good way to uh to go ahead and many of you have already solved this one sort of solved this one because uh, once again, I'm pretty sure that after bishop takes b3, which is clearly the right starting move here, I'm pretty sure the engine will take on a5, and then the solution is reasonably simple. 
Uh, my bigger issue here is if we take on B3 and white go A, B, that I actually haven't solved yet. Uh, and, and that one is kind of tricky because somewhat shockingly, what I thought must be the solution doesn't appear to be working. But I guess we can, uh, because I took such a long time sort of running my mouth off on the quote-unquote preface to the show, we can just sort of take it as we go along. So we go bishop takes b3. Ah, ab actually is played. I'm very happy about this. So if bishop takes a5, we take on c2, we take on b2, and then if the king goes back to c1, we have rook c8, which is basically mate. And if the king goes to a1, we have rook takes a2, double check, and then rook a1 mate. So that's all very easy. I'm very happy it goes ab, actually. Uh, and now, uh, like the assumption is you play queen a1 check, and then you play rook takes c2, and then you play queen takes b2. But this is not actually mate. It's a couple of checks, but it's not even remotely uh, remotely mate. You can start with bishop takes b2, but then the king, I think, runs in this direction. So it's also not that clear. And I've been sort of thinking about this for a bit, and I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how we're supposed to go about things. We can go bishop b2, uh, king d2, queen takes d5, but then after king e1, we uh, still have to solve some issues because the rook on c7 is hanging. <clears throat> yes, we can start with rook c2, but I don't know what that does after king takes c2. If we want to play rook c2, I'm pretty sure we're supposed to give a check on a1 first. <clears throat> um, how much of a match is mind games? Quite a lot, yeah, I think quite a lot. There is a lot of... Uh, sort of struggle for supremacy, struggle for, you know, winning small battles. Because I think in a match between two players of roughly the same strength, uh, you, I mean, unless somebody has a really, really poor couple of wigs, th you know, the match will be decided by, you know, a couple of relatively small moments, which will go one way or the other. And yeah, I'm still, I'm still confused here. It's, uh, It's very weird that I, I like I genuinely don't have any idea how this is solved. Yeah, bishop b2, the, the issue with bishop b2, as I mentioned, is the king will run in this direction. King takes b2, I, I refuted. But after bishop b2, I think the king goes here, and I don't know how we refute that. Uh, can you predict what kind of openings will be likely pl based b played based based on their preferences? I don't I don't know. Yeah, that like Considering the amount of time they had and considering the strength of the the teams behind them, we can see something neither of them have played before. Like, Jan has been a Grunfeld player more or less his entire life. People are saying bishop h6, but I just don't... Like, it's not a winning move. I'm pretty sure we're supposed to give mate here. Let's just try something. Yeah, that's kind of wrong. Uh, okay, then, then we do this. I'm very disappointed with the engine here. Because this is actually not very difficult. I still don't know how we refute King G2. Uh, people are suggesting King G2, Rook C2, King C2, Queen A2. But then the king runs. I don't think we catch him. And it's it's really kind of... Uh, I mean, it will, it will leave me with the feeling of not having solved the puzzle, really. Because King takes B2, I know how we solve. We just go Queen A3 check. And then we go rook a8, and it's... Ah, okay, I missed c4, but it, it's not really all that important, I'm pretty sure, because I, I guess we can go... Um, I guess we can go rook c4... Well, ah, hang on. I guess it's the other the other order. I guess it wants me to give... No? Okay. Ah, yeah, okay. Why am I so... So completely off base here? That's weird, because I, I assumed I solved it. Yeah, we can just... Yeah, I guess it's just because I didn't want to make a, a capture. Like, whenever there's a there's a choice, I want to make a move which is not a forced capture. But I guess we can just go BC. Yeah. I was trying to find some kind of mate with checks, sacrificing more pieces, but I guess the solution is kind of prosaic here. Um. So... Yeah, I'm still confused how we refute King D2. 
King g2, queen takes d5, we go king e1, the rook is hanging, the queen is hanging. Bishop c3 check, we can go king f2. Very, very uncertain why, why this is so bad for white. Uh, somebody said queen b, yeah, this is actually very pretty. After king d2, we can play something like queen a6 or queen b5, cutting off this diagonal and creating a threat of bishop c3 check. This is probably the solution, and it's very, very beautiful, but like, I would genuinely prefer for this to be the end of the puzzle, king g2, queen b5, or queen a6, compared to the kind of the brute force that we had to demonstrate after king takes b2. Okay, moving swiftly on. Uh, this looks like a Caro, I like this. This I am reasonably certain. I know which line, even which line of the Karakan this is. There's a specific line of the knight c3 d4, knight e4, bishop f5, bishop g6, Karo, <clears throat> uh, that leads to these positions. After queen a6, king e1, we just go rook takes c2 and we crash through and we win. Uh, and I'm pretty sure the solution here <clears throat> is uh, it seems like it's a kind of a positional struggle, but if you take a moment to to ponder, you will realize that the king on g, uh, g1 is kind of uh, vulnerable. And yeah, what Ferdisert is saying is very, very promising looking. And we can use the fact that there is a pin on the f2 pawn to uh, actually land the queen on g3. So we go knight f3 check. We go rook takes e4. Just sort of removing the defenders by brute force. And then we land the queen on g3. And I think here we just go queen takes f2. I would assume. And uh, the threat of queen g1 mate is uh, too strong and uh, white's position just completely collapses after bishop e3. We can just go knight takes e3 and uh, the threat of knight f1, the threat of queen takes f3 is <clears throat> just overwhelming, so white is completely lost here. This one is actually the first one where I was like 100% certain that I solved it correctly. Uh, ha, huh, interesting. It's a very, very similar position to the one we just solved in puzzle number two, but with colors reversed. And, uh, uh, and now it's white to move, so white should be making, uh, uh, a lot of, a lot of progress. Rook g4, f rook g4, even queen takes f1, uh, competitive driver. Yeah, I should not have tried. Announcing your name to the stream. Yeah, we go, like, unfortunately, the first move here is more or less obvious because there's actually definitive initiative for, I mean, like, definite initiative for, for black on, on the queen side. This is a very large threat. The king on c1 is nowhere near safe. Uh, happy Thursday to you too, Mr. Carson. Uh, and if we play h6, black will just play, uh, black will just play f6 and that sort of, uh, uh, our attack fizzles. So we have to start by hg. Black obviously goes fg. And I assume we, we have to go rook h7 here. Uh, which is, um, once again, it's, it's kind of a, when the solution starts with a couple of moves which are sort of as brute force as those two are, um, you, you feel like you, you aren't really being given a choice to go wrong. But you kind of need to do this, and then probably this. And now you have to think, because there's there's definitely still some thinking uh, required here. The king is about to run towards uh, towards e8, so we, we kind of need to stop that. That's a very, very precise usage of that emote. That's basically what that emote was created for. I, I salute you, Universal Chess Life. And what uh, simple Sim Sim Simpson is suggesting, uh, rook h8, king f7, queen f4, uh, is what I've been calculating, but I don't know where the mate is after king g7. This is my issue. I, I don't know how we win after king g7. And yeah, I think we actually are supposed to attack the pawn on g6 here by playing either queen e4 or queen g4. So now we, we kind of need to figure out which, which of those two moves is, uh, the strongest. 
And I'm not entirely sure, because both of them actually allow bishop e8. My biggest issue with the moves like queen e4 and queen g4 here is that uh, they allow the they allow the the bishop to land on e8, and uh, with that bishop um, starting to participate in the defense, we might find it much more difficult to actually give mate in uh, in this position. Final queen d3, because I think if you are choosing how to attack the pawn on g4 here, you definitely want to choose one of these two squares because the queen can, you know, attack the rook from there, give a check from e6, continue on to h4, and so on. If you if you put it on d3, it will be um, much less active. Uh, people are suggesting rook h8, rook, uh, queen f4, queen h6, which is definitely something we can try, but then the king comes back to f7, and I still don't know how we win, which is a bit annoying to me. It looks promising, but I, I still cannot figure out why we're doing so well there. Uh, take the bishop, like if we if we take on a4, we give black, I think, way too much counterplay. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit confused, but I think it might be something like queen g4 or queen e4. Okay, so that's not the one. Is this the one? So it actually is some sort of brute force. I'm very confused. Let's see. Uh, can we maybe play something like rook h7 check and then the queen can attack something? I was looking at that as well, like rook h7, king e8, and then either queen e4 or queen g7 or some kind of a move like that. But I think all of those moves are really nicely met by rook c7, so that doesn't work. So I guess it's actually queen f4. And in this position we no longer really have a choice, so we go queen h6. Uh, and now I have to ask myself, what am I missing? Because I'm obviously missing something. But I don't know what. And I've been thinking about this for a while, and I still don't really have any kind of a good solution here. I mean, <clears throat> we can uh, liquidate into a better queen ending, maybe, but like that's clearly... Uh, Clearly not like the outcome we're gunning. I guess we can just once again, maybe I'm just I, I dislike the idea of taking pawns with every move so much that I just refuse to look at solutions. Okay. Weird. I guess we start with this. And then this. And then this. And then I guess this. Okay, I figured out what my problem is with this series of puzzles. Uh, my problem with this series of puzzles is I want to give mate and they are forcing me to instead win the game by winning a lot of material. And everything in my mind and in my soul kind of says, but I don't want to. I want to give mate. Why are you forcing me to trade pieces? Why are you forcing me to liquidate into some kind of a queen ending? And it makes me very sad and unhappy. <clears throat> it really is completely winning, though, because uh, if black takes on f8 here, we take on e7. And the issue for black is, apart from the fact that the rook on f8 will be lost, you actually have to play queen d7, because if in this position you go with the king back, this is a check. And if you go with the king forward, I will even start by taking on d6 with check. And only after that I will pick the rook up. So I will be like five pawns against one in the queen ending, completely winning. But yeah, I think I figured out why these puzzles are presenting me with so many problems. I just don't like the fact that I have to settle for what I feel like is less than what I wanted to end up with. Why is the Peter Oof face just his face normally? Uh, you know, it's one of those, it's one of those questions which is, you know, contains the answer in itself. If you think about it for a second, much will become very obvious to you. Um, and now we, uh, come to, uh, the final puzzle, <clears throat> the final puzzle in this set. And this one actually does look like we don't, we, we, we will not have to settle. We will actually give mate here. <clears throat> uh, and 
People have already uh, suggested the, the, what I think is the correct move here, and we're kind of running a bit late, so let's just make it on the board and proceed to pile on with everything uh, and just give mate on g7. And like the, the, the bigger issue here is that if black takes, of course, we're not taking ef, we're going rook g3 anyway, knight of 5 rook of 5 uh, We almost had the cat on stream, but she decided she did not want to hang around with me. Unfortunately, uh, I was really, I was really hoping for, for the cat to make an appearance. We are, we are graced by my, my son's cat. She doesn't actually live with us, uh, but she is, she's come for, for a stay. And, uh, I think she settled enough that she's not really scared of me all that much, but clearly doesn't want to be on camera. So, okay, that's the first set of puzzles. And the second one we will use, what's the cat's name? The cat is called Martha. Your thoughts on Aryan winning Data Steel India? Uh, after Riga, I don't think anybody is shocked. Before Riga, I would have been kind of shocked, honestly. But uh, after Riga, we kind of all know how good the kid is. And uh, uh, yeah, it's still an amazing achievement for him to win one and tie for first in the second one. Considering that, you know, a month ago he was... A very, very well hidden secret. I understand that the Indian chess community and like Visha gave some interviews saying that like we knew, but people outside didn't know. Uh, but now the people outside also know. <laughs> uh, the kid is, the kid is unbelievably good. I did not get to play against him in Riga and I'm kind of thankful for that because it, and, you know, because of, because I kind of missed him. It, I, I managed to finish in the top 10, but yeah, he is, he is very, very solid. And yeah, this one, <clears throat> this one, uh, we already have some answers in, uh, uh, in chat. And this is Simon Williams's, uh, course on bishops of opposite color and expert level again. And uh, as people correctly point, I, I mean, the, the big question for me is, is there any difference if I start with bishop of eight? And I think there's actually no difference whatsoever. But like, is there? Huh. Curious. Ah, okay. I think I know why this is wrong. I think the point is, if we start with bishop with rook h1 check, <clears throat> after king g8, bishop f8, there is bishop c2, bishop h7. So we start by doing this. And then we do this. All the while keeping our eye on the c2 square. So we play bishop g7 here, preventing bishop c2, and now we can take on c2. And then we go rook h2 and we give mate. Yeah, it, it, it didn't actually <clears throat> uh, occur to me that black has any defense at all. And then after uh, <clears throat> the engine corrected my rook h1 check, I realized what the reason must be. Uh, so yeah, and uh, generally when you look at this position, black is a pawn up, but uh, in positions like this, like relative king safety is maybe the most important. Uh, yeah, but Rook h1 runs into king g8, but that's not an issue. The issue is specifically bishop c2, because <clears throat> after bishop f8, you still cannot take on f8, because I give rook h8 mate, uh, Shashank. <clears throat> so that wasn't the problem for me at all. The problem was, I did not really realize a defensive mechanism exists at all. Uh, and this is why, <clears throat> you know, from a purely kind of a, as a puzzle solver, if we start by bishop f8 here, we're not sacrificing anything. And if we start by giving this check and then playing bishop f8, we are sort of making a move with a quote-unquote sacrifice. Uh, so this is why I preferred that move order, but clearly not allowing bishop c2 is much more important. <clears throat> and yeah, I assume I missed the start of... Uh, I assume I missed the start of the, the discussion, but what uh, Kasbarov said there in chat is absolutely correct. And the reason why people aren't... Um, uh, and the reason why people aren't really answering questions about their teams is specifically what Kasbarov said. You can actually make 
some deductions from your choice of seconds regarding the openings you might play. Uh, and that would be obviously very, very suboptimal for your, uh, you know, for your strategy because you really don't want to be giving away any kind of info apart from, you know, the info you cannot help but give away. But give away. So yeah, because Barov is absolutely correct. And as I was saying, like the king safety here, uh, the king safety here is hugely important. And also, noticeably, <clears throat> both the bishop on b3 and the rook on c6 aren't really participating in the defense of the black king at all, which is why we actually have time to make two quiet moves here and create a non-check threat. This is, I mean, this is a huge, huge threat, but it's not a check. But black just cannot do anything about it at all because of how passive and kind of disconnected uh, their pieces are. <clears throat> What if you lie about your team? I think that's sort of considered unethical. Uh, what's up, Paul Borda? Let's see if that was improved since the last time. Huh, apparently not. Um, uh, I mean, if that command doesn't exist, that answer doesn't get answered. I mean, that question doesn't get answered. Uh, next exercise. I think I've seen this position, and this is yet another position where uh, the bishops of opposite color make white's attack just so, so much stronger. Uh, and uh, I can already see how to win the bishop on d6 with checks, as I'm sure do most of you, but I assume we would like to give mate here, so I will continue looking. Uh, but yeah, white is clearly winning. You know, the simplest way to win this in a practical game is bishop before check, king h6, queen e6 check, and then just take on d6 without even thinking. Uh, but in a position like this, you definitely want more. But currently, I don't think there is more. Or at least I can't figure out. We can start with queen h5 check, but after queen h6, I don't know what we've gained. I think we basically get to the exactly this. Ah, yeah. The, yeah, what you're saying is interesting, Markov, but the issue there, queen h5, queen h6, bishop g8, check. Black will just play king g7, queen f7, check, king h8. And uh, the king on h8 is actually kind of safe, and we also no longer can even win the bishop on d6. So I'm pretty sure we have to start with this. And then there's really only one check in the position, which is queen a6. And now... I would like to give mate. So how do I do that? Because obviously we can just take on d6 here and uh, our opponent will resign. g4 allows queen takes g4 with check and we actually will not win the game. Uh, What's the most nasty way to turn my opponent's Sicilian preparation to some other uh, opening, except playing 1e4? Um, I'm not sure I understand exactly what you're asking, but I really am not, you know, a huge proponent of not playing the main lines. Yeah, it's kind of weird that we don't, like, none of us can actually see the mate. We can make some kind of a quiet move like king of 3 but I still don't see how that gives mate. We can go bishop f3, king g5, and then, like, gh, but king takes h4 is a discovered check in that line. Everything wins, uh, uh Kaos, zk. Like, the position is completely winning. We can just take on d6. The question is how to get the most out of it, and I'm... Yeah, maybe... Yeah, this is actually kind of clever. Queen f5 and g4. Maybe this is uh, the way to go. This puzzle, I will be entirely honest with you, I'm not a huge fan because of just, like, you generally don't want your, the position you're trying to solve in the puzzle. You don't want the, the position to be so completely winning, even without the solution. Because it kind of discard, like, it, 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 it's, it's a little bit dispiriting to know that basically you can just, you know, do whatever you please here and you will still win the game. Uh, and, and yeah, this looks very strong because we've created a threat of queen h1, uh, queen h5 mate. And if queen g5 we will give mate from h7, 
all of these checks, we will just put the queen on the king on h3, and uh, it will be safe from checks there. So yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a nice solution, but it's a little bit, you know, you are a little bit less interested when you know there's pretty much nothing at stake, considering how winning you are. Yeah, there should be an extra rook on b8. Exactly, simple, simple. Yeah, like the same position, but just put put an additional piece somewhere for black, so that queen takes d6 isn't actually winning the game. And then it's it's a very very nice puzzle. <sighs> All right, next one. Um, Black has just played apparently rook c8, e8, which makes me extremely eager to play e6, because we are attacking the queen on c7 and also creating a very strong threat of ef7, and. Because we're already one hour in, and I should at some point start playing against uh, the chess, uh, the Kasparov Chess dot uh, members, I should probably try to play a bit faster. So we go e6, rook is ah, okay. Uh, at least now I understand why this is a puzzle. Because I, for a moment there, I wasn't even sure, uh, quite simply, why Black wasn't resigning there. But rook e7 is a very clever defense, and now we actually have to think, because. Uh, queen c7, rook c7, everything is still sort of protected. Uh, and uh, uh, we do have to find some way to break through. My first idea here is to go ef, rook takes f7, and then queen g6. Establishing a very, very strong battery on the, uh, you know, b1, h7 diagonal. It is indeed bitter, the worst in chess. Um, do you think it will be uh, more challenging for Nepo to come back if he goes behind, as, as he has less championship experience rather than Magnus? I think, yeah, if Magnus starts well, if Magnus wins a game or, you know, a couple, definitely, like, the match will be very, very difficult to come back from for, for Jan, because I think Magnus, when he actually, you know, starts feeling that he's on top, uh, he will start, you know, it will also improve his game. He will start playing better. Because I think most of us, I definitely know this to be true about myself once again. It's like uh, playing when you're feeling confident, playing when you're feeling like you're sort of on top of the world and the pieces listen to you and things kind of flow. You you play much better. You uh, Your general outlook on life is just much better. So um, I think, uh, you know, Generally, coming back from deficits is going to be difficult, but uh, your point about experience is also uh, quite a valid one. I think it's correct. I, I don't see any other forcing ways to win. You can start by rook f7, but then queen takes g3. So I think we have to play ef, and then we have to play queen g6. And now the question is what we take on f5 with. I'm pretty sure that, you know, strictly speaking, both moves are winning. But I would like to keep the f file open for my rook here. I think it's probably cleaner to take with the queen. Huh, okay. My reasoning there was we will be giving a check from h7 in both cases, and the king will go to the f file. And then with a the bishop on f5, rook f1 will not be a check. Uh, and I would like it to be a check. Uh, but we'll take. Ah, oh, that's actually, you know, I'm a little bit unhappy about this, because yes, the position looks completely winning, and probably is completely winning, but the fact that it doesn't really make us show how we will win this position is uh, you know, making me feel like we're, you know, we haven't gotten the entire thing solved yet. But yeah, obviously Black is in desperate, desperate trouble here because of how many threats we have on the light pieces. Oh, on the light squares, sorry. Um, next one. Black just played h7, h6. I'm pretty sure I have actually seen this. It's obviously a Sicilian. And, uh, well, actually, maybe not obviously. It could be, I'm pretty sure it is a Sicilian, but it could be some kind of a King's Indian as well. Is it because queen of 5 rook of 8, queen g6? We're not playing queen g6, we're playing queen h7. And it doesn't really run very far. It's cut off. Um, like if we take with the queen, uh, black plays rook f8 here, we go queen h7, check king f7. It only runs if we allow him to run, 
because uh, currently it's cut off along the e-file. We can, for instance, play bishop g6 check, king f6, bishop h5, and there is no good defense against queen g6 mate. I'm really kind of confused why queen f5 is a mistake here. But moving, moving on. So what's happening here? Um, it's a kind of a typical position where white made a lot of progress. White made a lot of progress on the queen side. The b7, b7 pawn is very weak. Um, but you still need to kind of break through. Uh, I am bitter, but well, not on this channel. Um, on this channel, there will be once again. I will. I will come back to that point because it's it's really a very very excellent point. Uh, uh, Gary, uh, with with help of uh, Matthew Sadler, who is a good friend of mine and uh, a, a very strong chess player, and also these days I think he is mainly known known for being uh, an expert on. Uh, computer chess. He wrote a very interesting book on the topic of neural networks and Alpha Zero in general, and I think there is a very good solution in chat. Yeah, it's it's kind of surprising how dominant we are in that position. Uh, and what I missed originally is the fact that by trading one of our beautiful bishop pair, we open up the third rank to play rook g3. So we take on e5. Of course, black takes with the rook because fe allows bishop d7, and now we just go rook d7. And then we go rook g3, and the bishop on g7 actually gets picked up. Um, uh, because it really has no squares after bishop h8. I assume we can maybe even go for some kind of a mating net, but we can also just play rook d8 check and rook takes h8, and uh, if rook e8 we can trade, play rook g8 check and pick it up. So uh, the lesson here, I think, has to be that despite the fact that normally you kind of hate giving up, you know, parting with with your bishop for the knight on e5, even though I mean it's a it's a knight that keeps the black black position together, but still it's a very nice bishop, and you don't like. Uh, you don't like trading it, uh, but as the the old aphorism says, you know one of the uh, one of the reasons why they call it the the advantage of the bishop pair is that you can find a good moment to actually trade one of the pair to to transform the advantage into something else. Uh, we have gotten every puzzle right, but uh, some of them not from from without mistakes, and uh, I definitely have had. A lot of help from chat today, as I really expected. Um, and in this one, I think I know, and once again, it's a kind of a weird one because uh, you generally don't like... Like, let's talk about the position first. I, I, I don't want to just press on. Uh, both, both kings are... Considering that there's a light square bishop left for black and the dark square bishop for white, and both structures are incredibly unsafe. Uh, it feels like, you know, the side that gets their bishop onto uh, a diagonal adjacent to the opponent's king will win. And I think this is where the difference is. The king on g1, like the, the black bishop, specifically I guess because there is a pawn on e4, the black bishop cannot get to the long diagonal, or even if it gets to the long diagonal, it cannot really create mating threats, because the bishop on e4 will actually be in the way of mating threats. Whereas for white, if you imagine our bishop on c3 and a queen on e5, for instance, you just know that this will be winning. And I think the solution here is kind of, once again, for a puzzle, to begin with two trades is maybe a little bit unusual, but I'm pretty sure the solution is quite simply trade, trade, and then put the queen on e5. And it's important to start with queen e5 here and not bishop c3, because if you play bishop c3, black will play queen a3, attacking, <clears throat> attacking the rook on c1, and because there is no comfortable way for us to protect the, the rook on c1, we are actually, I think, in that line sort of in trouble, because if you play rook c2 there, uh, queen a1 check is actually made. If you can imagine, like, 
we go bishop c3, queen comes here, we go rook c2, and black can, for instance, go queen takes c3, rook takes c3, rook a1 check, then bishop f1 check, and then bishop h3, discovered mate along the back rank. So this is why we're starting with queen e5, because now after queen a3, we will just pick up the bishop on c4 and win kind of easily. And after rook d8, I guess we just go bishop c3, king f7, and we just go in and uh, mate, mate the black king in the center. <clears throat> Maybe bishop b2 and uh, white survives after queen a3. I don't think so, actually, because bishop c3, queen a3, bishop b2, we will take, rook c4, check from here. And then maybe there's a perpetual, but yeah, we're fighting for a draw there. There's definitely no reason for white to subject themselves to it. And we have actually solved the entirety of the two of the two sets of puzzles. Uh, the second one was well uh, a little bit more cheerful than, than the first, as the modes promised me, because we, we did get to give a lot of mates in the second one. Um <clears throat> and I, I also think they were generally a little bit simpler, uh, a little bit simpler than than the first set, but uh, still I think quite quite instructive. And the the, the general sort of <clears throat> idea that these types of positions should be hammering into you is that if you can launch a direct attack against your opponent's king with uh, the opposite color bishops on the board, the attack will be much much stronger. Than, uh, uh, than otherwise, because your opponent really will have no useful ways of dealing. Like in this position, once the bishop gets to c3, it just has no opposition on the board at all. And uh, that makes defending against it almost impossible. Is Peter below 2700? Absolutely, yes. Yes, Siri. And now I will play against... Uh, the wonderful, wonderful users of the Kasparov Chess uh, .com, uh, website. Uh, so, as usual, uh, challenging uh, Paul Borda on on the site will work. I will try, you know, as much as I, as I can remember the usernames. I will try to play people who I think I haven't played before. <clears throat> and uh, let me switch to a different view. Uh, and, uh, three minute challenges are best. I will take three and five minute challenges. Definitely nothing slower than five minutes and preferably no bullet, even though, you know, if I'm absolutely forced to, I can play bullet. I just don't know, uh, you know, how much of a teachable moment I can make a bullet game. Uh, playing the Nidorf here, uh, f3 is definitely something, I mean, bishop b3 and f3 is definitely something that uh, I played a, a good bit myself, but I've never played h5 in this position, and this is a kind of a newfangled way of playing these types of positions, uh, even with the pawn on e6. With the pawn on e5, this has been a kind of a motif for ages, but they also <clears throat> started doing this with the pawn, uh, with the pawn on e6. Just to make it much harder for White to uh, launch the kind of a normal English attack type uh, advance on uh, the king side, I should be paying attention to the sacrifices on b5. I would like to play queen c7 here, but I am not entirely sure I can because of the potential sacrifices on the b5 square. I will start by playing knight e5. Um, F4, I think, is a good reaction. I mean, I'm definitely being extremely provocative with a move like Knight E5 because White is uh, very, very well developed, and my king is still in the center, so I could very easily just get mated here. But if I don't get mated in the next, I don't know, five, like I mean, I'm not going to get mated in the next five moves. But if uh, 
<laughs> Famous last words, I guess. Yeah, I could actually get made it here, but um, structurally, uh, as is often the case in these types of you know Nidorfs and or you know Scheveningens, uh, Scheveningens. <clears throat> Structurally, Black's position is very, very healthy. And uh, uh, if you survive the opening, if you actually manage to get... Uh, uh, if I is not a mistake at all, Prod, uh, I, I don't agree with your, with your statement there at all. What platform is that? You are on the Kasparov Chess uh, Twitch channel. Because so that probably should be should be a bit of a hint there. Ninety four was a mistake though. I don't think e five was necessarily a mistake because I was kind of worried in this position I will blunder some sort of knight takes e six tactic, but that didn't actually materialize, and now I am up a decent chunk of material. I can play queen c8 and then just take on d8 when rook d8 happens, or I can play queen e7, which which is maybe, I mean it's greedier, but I think it's fine. I don't want to uh, give up, uh, give up any of my extra material if I don't have to. Are you planning on watching the ashes? The time zones make it very difficult. The time zones and also the fact that I will be working, sort of. Not all through the ashes, because obviously they will continue. I assume that the schedule is very close to what the normal schedule is, and they will, you know, there will be a Boxing Day test, and uh, uh, they will probably continue into 2022, I, my assumption is. But uh, with the amount of work I will be doing for the match, I... I feel like I should not be ruining my sleep schedule even more by, you know, staying up until ungodly hours or waking up at ungodly hours to watch the cricket. Even though, even though, like the ashes is the you know the the, the thing that I the thing that I, that I care the most I think in 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 the entirety of cricket because I am for my sins I am a an England fan. And uh, as an England fan, I I definitely care very much about about the Ashes. Second test starts at six a.m. Then maybe it's manageable. Magnus is playing basketball. He always plays some kind of sports during uh, during matches. I assume it's like on some sort of. Uh, on Instagram or somewhere, people have posted pictures. It really is nothing new at all for him. He generally prefers to stay active, to kind of take his mind off of things. <clears throat> You're asking an England fan for his favorite batsman. How cruel. Shots fired, Jake. And it's, you know, I think my, you know, my... My Discord will disown me if I don't say it's Michael Atherton. So it is Michael Atherton. Um, you're welcome, Shiro Shiro. Why haven't I played B5 yet? I don't really know. <clears throat> the pawn really should have been on B5 by this point. There is some kind of knight takes e4 shenanigans which sometimes work in these types of positions, but I don't really need to. Position is good enough without. Are you partaking in the world rapid than blitz? I'm hoping to. As with, uh, I'm sure everybody else these days, you know, like I'm not very, very confident in any kind of long term planning. Like I think uh, only extremely optimistic people, and I don't really count myself among the Extremely optimistic people. Only extremely optimistic people, you know, make definitive plans for the future and expect to be able to keep them these days. But 
Uh, <coughs> the plan definitely is to play the world record on Blitz, yes. Are you playing 3-0? Yeah, I am very happily playing 3-0 today. I will play bishop uh, e5. I, I could play bishop e5 here. Maybe I will is a strong statement, but I kind of wonder. I think it's a good idea, actually, because I want to provoke f4. I think provoking f4 gives me additional um, additional chances later because there might be some checks along this diagonal which I could be uh, which I could be using. Why am I allowing bishop takes e6 exactly? I am becoming annoyed. At my, I, I do have rook c6 there, so maybe it's not that stupid, but I definitely should have at least considered for longer because, before making that move. Yeah, talking like, I, I assume the, the, the start of that conversation was people saying that, you know, cricket is a, is a sport for soft people. And it definitely isn't. Like it very, very certainly isn't. And uh, if anything, it's it's actually. I mean, I'm I'm also very certain on that point. Like com comparing cricket to, uh, to yeah, I am playing viewers now. Uh, I am. Uh, compared to to baseball, you know, the one very marked difference between cricket and baseball is that you are allowed to aim that ball at the batsman's body. It's perfectly legal to basically try to... I should try to not blunder Queen H7 mate next move, by the way. It will be a little bit embarrassing if I blunder Queen H7 mate. Peter would know because he's soft. Yeah. I'm a big softy, me. Um, yeah, so... What in baseball would result in, you know, people emptying the dugouts and, you know, an actual fight breaking out, as I understand it, is a perfectly legal delivery in cricket. No, but like if you, like if you actually hit the batsman, you, the batter. Uh, that's, uh, that does result with, uh, you know, Emptying the dugouts. And yeah, in cricket, you know, the ball being aimed at your head is a very, very, on purpose, not by mistake, is a very, very usual occurrence. Happens every match. You know, more than one time per over these days. So... Not a sport for big softies, despite what people might think. I keep on playing knight bd7 against bishop g5 and then not knowing any theory, which is not really a recipe for success. Uh, and I probably should stop doing that at some point. Yeah, people were really... And obviously there is a really horrible, horrible uh, accident which resulted in uh, uh, it was 2014, right? The um, for, like shamefully, I'm blanking on the name of the batsman, which I really shouldn't be because I know. But uh, a person actually died from yeah, sorry, Hughes exactly, Philip Hughes. A person actually died from mistiming a hook shot. So, yeah, things can happen. <clears throat> I don't really like my position very much, honestly. Um, I will have to be extremely careful in the next few moves because, uh, once again, strategically we're doing fine, but... 
it's not really about strategy when you're this far, this far behind uh, in development. It wasn't Bishop H4 better? I was expecting Bishop H4 prod, uh, and I wasn't sure how I was going to react. Yeah. I don't think Bishop takes F6 is a horrible move, but I was expecting Bishop H4. I don't think white necessarily needs to give me any trades at all in this position. Yeah, well, and, and once again, we, we've spoke about this a bit earlier, but the way software is written on Kasparov chess, while I'm playing, you, you cannot send the challenge because the player who is in game appears busy and doesn't, doesn't really accept challenges at all. So you have to kind of try to time it uh, to coincide with me ending this game. Was that the one where the ball went through the bars in the helmet? It basically, he, he played the shot too quickly. If you know what the, what the hook shot looks like, he basically played a, what is called a horizontal bat shot. And he played it quicker than the ball got to him. And he got turned around and he got hit in the side of the neck, basically, where there's, and because of that incident, uh, the helmets now look different. Specifically to cover that area which wasn't covered before the Phil Hughes incident. He got hit in the side of the neck where there was no protection. This got a little bit... Whoa, that's a bit unfortunate because that's a full queen that is being given to me. I mean, I will take it, but that was an interesting game up until this moment. And we probably should move on to sort of more cheerful subjects because, you know, contemplating one's, one's mortality is, you know, something we do, but maybe something we don't absolutely have to do while streaming chess. Uh, thanks very much for the sub, uh, J, JDW2281. Is Russia into cricket? Not at all, no. But I have English friends. And I got introduced to the game more than 20 years ago, and I kind of got completely hooked. I will play something I've been playing for a while now, and I don't think it's that great, but I also don't think people know exactly why it's not that great. Yeah, and I don't think it's e3 in this position specifically. I think, yeah, I mean, it's not a bad move, but there's definitely ways to try to punish what Black is doing here, which are harsher than this. This should be a reasonably comfortable position for black now, because e3 is not optimal. I get to win this tempo with bishop g4. If the queen goes somewhere, I can even maybe contemplate playing queen d7 or queen c8 with ideas of bishop h3, not bishop h2. Um, and uh, yeah, generally speaking, you're supposed to castle here. You're not supposed to play e3. Does Trent know you're calling him your friend? Uh, he just assumes. He doesn't know, but that would be his his assumption regardless. I am giving, basically, wasn't there knight takes six instead of castles? I'm giving up this pawn for initiative in pretty much every single position here. This is a good reaction, by the way, by my opponent. I quite like what my opponent is doing. I still think my position is good, but uh, bishop g4, knight takes e6 is a good sequence, and I very much endorse, endorse what, my, what my opponent is doing here. Haven't seen LT around later. What what is he up to these days? Judging by his Twitter, he is uh uh whatever GM is, he is probably GMing, and I don't mean Grandmaster. He is uh you know to the mooning or shorting or you know shorting and then it goes to the moon. Some of those things. I'm crazy on the details. 
So my compensation here is based on the fact that the queen on e4 is kind of vulnerable. I can, uh, I can continue, you know, hassling it with bishop f5. There's also the pawn on c4 hanging. And uh, it's not actually easy to make a comfortable move here for black. I don't think he actually ended... I, I, I think he ended up not betting on getting the title uh, diver. I don't think that materialized. I have a feeling he was kind of serious, but then he either got discouraged or he got no takers or both. Like I genuinely don't think the bet is the, the bet is on. Queen B seven is sensible, but I can take on C four straight away. I can also throw in Rook C seven and just ask my opponent once again like where the queen is supposed to go after. But it goes to a6, which is a decent enough square. So there's... Uh, I will just take on c4, because I, I, I don't really care about... Uh, the a7 pawn all that much. I want to play on the king side. I want to try and uh, develop some some sort of an attack. Ruby one is a very very strange move here, though. I I like having played queen b7. I think you are supposed to um, you are supposed to um, take on a7 because I might not give you that option ever again. You can just play a5 here and uh, that pawn might never return. Yeah, I think my opponent is kind of going slightly astray here. These moves I, I no longer really like. You should either be developing more pieces or you should be picking up some pawns to, you know, have some hope for the endgame. Like, if you're a pawn up, it will limit my options. It will make me want to end the game tactically somehow because uh, I will know that endgames no longer favor me. Uh, how do we go about things here? I think provoking e4 makes a lot of sense. I have created the threat of bishop g3 apart from hitting the rook on b1. Yeah, and now we can go to h3 and we also have access to the f3 square for the, for the knight. So I am beginning to assemble... Uh, you know, something that looks like it might be a mating attack in the future. D4 or E4 tomorrow? Um, Jan is, like, historically he's a 1E4 player. But he definitely can and has, in like, he, he played a decent amount of the, of the English... I mean, even 1c4 is definitely not out of the question. I don't think it's a bad move against Magnus, honestly. Because I think Magnus against 1c4 doesn't really try to, you know, equalize by force. He tries to go for uh, unclear, sort of interesting, playable, unclear positions, which I think, uh, you know, is something that both of them will be inc incredibly interested in. I think both of them very much like playing uh playing complicated unclear positions. I feel like there should be some sort of mate, but there isn't, so I will go off the material. I think a bone club would be nice this uh yeah. I mean I actually you know the amount of pearl clutching that that one bone cloud between Magnus and Hikaru the amount of pearl clutching that resulted from that one game was really a sight to behold, and uh, it actually made me kind of sympathetic to to the whole idea of playing Bone Cloud, which I normally wouldn't be. But people absolutely lost lost their their shit. I I apologize for the slightly coarse language, but. People absolutely lost it. 
as a result of that one game. And uh, really, you shouldn't be taking anything in life this seriously. But in the World Championship, no. Don't do that in the World Championship. Any chance of seeing uh, uh, seeing a Grunfeld? Not impossible at all, yeah. I'm going to try something here, if I can remember how it goes, which is very much not a given. There are some lines here which people have been trying recently, which are... Uh, yeah, I think this sort of more or less loses, actually. This is one of, one of the big points of what I'm trying to achieve here, is that you cannot actually do this. You're supposed to play bishop 7 because uh, this transposition just kind of kills black outright. Well, maybe not kills, but it's a, it's a very, very dangerous position for black suddenly. Maybe not, actually. Maybe you can just castle here. Maybe I've I've overstated my hand here. Yeah, it's not that bad. I take everything back. <clears throat> it's really not that bad. I do get a kind of a pleasant little edge, but it's nothing spectacular. Will we see anything apart from neither from Rue Lopez? I'm pretty sure we will, yes. I'm pretty sure there will be some closed openings. I don't know which ones, but I'm pretty sure there will be some closed openings, maybe even from both players. I wouldn't really rule out, you know, the the majority of the match being discussed in in the non e four uh, territory at all. Uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Plink, I I know what you're talking about, and I also have to kind of constantly make an effort to uh, take a look on the left where the clocks are because uh, the clocks definitely uh, they sneak up on you a little bit here. You you kind of. Uh, you are lulled in a kind of a false sense of security by by the fact that they don't like blare alarms at you when you're below 20 seconds and so on. But um, yeah, I don't know why I was so happy about my opening. It's just a very very boring, typical-ish Berlin-ish position where I'm not even remotely better. Do we need to refresh the page in order to challenge? No, uh, you, you have to kind of try to time it uh, to coincide with me f finishing this game because uh, challenges just don't go through while I'm playing. Yeah, this is a very, very quiet position. I don't know how much of of a chance to even outplay my opponent I have in a position like this. And my opponent is uh, playing very, very sensibly. I am very much in agreement with many of uh, my opponent's decisions here. I will play uh, rook e4 here. Knight f5 is a very sensible move, but specifically with the, with the pawn on f7 still somewhat vulnerable with the king not on g8, I think it's maybe a little bit early. And this is definitely uh, a big improvement for me. Uh, because this structure is a lot more cheerful for me. This is now might actually transpose to a very Berlin-like structure, but uh, the bigger issue than then the structure is that I'm getting to play rook d7 here, uh, which will generate genuine threats black will have to pay attention to. And yeah, as I mentioned, I am very, very heavily using the fact that the, the king is the king is not on g8. Black could have uh, instead of knight f5, if you just play King g8 here, I don't really have any kind of a way to make immediate progress. But until that moment, my opponent was playing a very, very decent game. Ok, 
Okay, I almost played the central gambit there for some kind of a strange reason. Uh, you're welcome, Nazir. I think I'm supposed to play 4 in this position, right? I actually wrote a video series on this at some point, I should be able to remember. A4 or A3 in this position. C3 is also possible, but these are the, the critical moves. This is a strange decision to my eyes, because I think I can actually take this pawn. I don't know why I am being given uh, this pawn. I wouldn't really be so free with material uh, in my opponent's spot. Is h3 knight b8 not a line there? There is a lot of, like, this is quite, quite similar to a lot of Spanish lines in general, and uh, there's definitely some positions where the knight uh, goes back to b8 to come to d7 later, for sure. I can play knight g5, but the rook will just go back, so I don't know what that achieves. I'll play h3 just because there's almost no position in the Spanish where playing h3 would be a mistake. And now I'm sort of more interested in this because rook e7 is much less harmonious than rook f8. And forcing black to play... Whoa. Yeah, that's a, that's a mistake. Maybe knight f7 was even harsher as a reply, but, you know cannot be a mistake to just take this exchange for, for free. And now we just get to collect, obviously. Whoa. That was probably not the button to press, but we will get back. Hmm. Were you using internet between games when you were playing in the candidates? Uh, define... Uh, yeah, I mean, I try to stay... I've become less strict about this uh, these days, chess fan, but I'm still reasonably strict. I don't actually, like, close down all of my messengers because I feel like, you know, people who have my phone number probably aren't going to, you know, randomly send me links which will upset me because they know better by this point. But I, I used to, like, legitimately never go to chess news websites of any kind, apart from Twig, just to download the new uh, the new games and uh, sort of not read uh, chess Twitter and generally just stay far, far away from, uh, you know, the opinion part of the Internet. Um I, I don't mind, I don't know why I'm not taking on e4, I'm kind of supporting my opponent in that, you know, my opponent is playing in a very kind of a romantic fischer tal type of spirit. There's been a lot of games between, I think specifically Fischer and Tal, which were, you know, they were discussing all these positions uh, with, with Tal on the white side of it, and, you know, a lot of pawns on e4 were sacrificed in those games, but I'm really sure there was at least one moment where I could have taken on e4 without too much harm coming to me. Uh, so yeah, like in, in the in the early years, I would definitely just make a very, very con conscious effort to not have access to any kind of uh, uh, chess websites so that I don't read something that will annoy me and might impact how I play in the next day. But these days I kind of care less about that and do actually occasionally read something. Can I play b5 here and not lose is the big question of the day. I don't know what the answer to it is. f5 is absolutely the correct way to play here, by the way. I didn't see the press conference. I, I don't actually have Instagram, and I think they made a kind of a weird 
to my eyes choice of streaming the entirety of it on Instagram. This is not great, but I couldn't really figure out what I was supposed to do, so I kind of went with the backup plan of... CB is interesting because... Ah, yeah. CB is probably not stupid at all, actually, because now you can play Rook C1 and I have to uh, react to that as well. Yeah, I think it was actually full streamed on Insta, the worst in chess. Uh, which is... Yeah, I, I don't know why you would do that. I mean, streaming on many platforms, including Instagram, I definitely understand, but as far as I could figure out, okay, I mean, if, if Maria streamed it on Twitch, then it was available somewhere else, but like, I have a, I have a chess list on Twitter where I, I mean, I follow, I don't remember exactly what the number is, but I follow definitely more than a hundred accounts specifically chess connected to be able to um, you know, get a kind of an immediate overview of what's happening. I don't like Rook takes C, Rook takes C1 was also very, very playable, but I didn't want to allow Knight takes F6. It's kind of curious that in a position like this, I actually would prefer to keep this bishop alive, maybe in some positions, because it can get to like those types of squares instead of this bishop, which is seemingly the better one of the pair. Um, It was published on YouTube later. Yeah, I I wasn't going to. Like, by that point, I have seen extensive quotes, and uh, I wouldn't say I'm a huge, you know, connoisseur of watching other people's press conferences. But honestly, I, I don't think they've done so badly from what I have seen. I understand you guys weren't very impressed, but I don't think, in particular, I think Magnus is, as I mentioned, he is a, a, generally a very good interview. Maybe not in this precise setting because of just how much pressure there is on it, but I don't think it was horrible. Yeah, Rook 6 we can just take only 4 here, chess drinker, I'm not worried. I'm much more worried about something like this. Because obviously, if this guy actually ends up on, on the d5 square, I will be quite, quite unhappy. But for the time being, uh, I feel like I'm reasonably in control here because knight c3 I could meet with b4 and the rook was still on d5. So the knight could not really occupy the, the ideal square. And now that the e4 bone is gone, like, yes, you can go knight c3, knight d5 here, but I will have picked up a lot of material in the meantime. And now I think I'm just winning because I get to play either rook c1 or rook c2 next move. Ah, yeah, I completely missed this move even existed, but I, my evaluation of the position, I think, remains very much the same. We are just kind of crashing through here. Thanks very much for, for the sub, uh, Yuho, Yuho J. <laughs> if you could compare Magnus to a Hearthstone card, what card would he be? Yeah, I think they were asked to, to compare each other to football players. Um, and I don't know what the answers were. Yeah, hashtag delete Diablo. Probably a couple more. I feel like this one and then maybe one more is where I will draw the line. I'm going a, a little bit. I feel like I'm a little bit frazzled by this point. I always used to play Queen G4 in this position. And I will play Queen G4 because I think it leads to... 
uh, the positions which are sort of, whoa, I assume that's a misclick. But that's a misclick which is basically kind of game ending here because uh, I can now stabilize and not give up my entire queen side. The rook, of course, has to go here. If there is a way, like I could signal to my opponent that I will let him take a take back, I could do that. But um, yeah, obviously, I have to play rook g8 to play c takes d4 next move. And uh, yeah, the way the way my opponent has done this, somewhat shockingly, I am not. I am not as entirely winning as I assumed I would be after this move, but I guess the simplest way is just to kind of play the same line, but with a... It still is much, much worse for black with the rook on f8 compared to the rook on g8, because the rook on g8 very, very often participates in the counterplay. Any thoughts on being number 45 out of 50 in Smerden's fight, Fighting Chess Index? Uh, I am very clearly not the most... Uh, fighting chess player in the history of chess. I am sort of at peace with that. I'm not happy or proud, but I am definitely sort of at peace with that, with that revelation. And, uh, I think I've improved. I think if you took my stats from like the mid nineties to the mid two thousands, it would have been worse. I think I've become more of a fighting player over the years compared to my youth. But yeah, there's definitely people out there who are a lot better saying no to draw offers. My issue is, and actually at some point I did some research on that, and I'm pretty sure I'm not lying to you guys about this, is that I don't offer very many draws, but I have a, an absolutely horrible time saying no to a draw offer. I wanted to play rook b7, but then there's rook bishop b5 in the end, and I'm actually not sure I survived that, so I have to play king takes d4, which is a bit annoying. Bishop b5 actually existed also here, so yeah, that was a bit of a blunder, but it might not cost me very much. Did you ever consider the French as black? Not really, because I just don't understand that opening at all. With either color. It's, I think it's one of the, one of the openings due to sort of the specific skill set which it encourages. It's it's one of the openings that I am sort of constitutionally incapable of playing well. Yeah, I don't think it's Kavalenko and Gawain. I think it's uh, Le Kuang Liam in first, and then I think it's Kramnik either in number two or number three. The list actually makes a decent amount of sense. Uh, Kramnik in his later years, like Kramnik in, in this phase of his career has been an unbelievably exciting fighting player. Seems a bit off that Fabi is ranked above Maggie. Uh, not really. It's fine. Amazing, it says. You won 15 rated live games in a row. Don't stop now. I will play one more. Then. After that bit of encouragement, I will definitely play play one more. Maybe even two more. No, French is a very, very interesting opening. It's just that I don't feel I understand how to play it. I I, I meant exactly what I said. It's not a criticism of the opening. It's it's criticism of my ability of, to play it. This move is very solid. Annoyingly solid, actually. Let's try to switch to some kind of a classical Scheveningen and see where it leads us. Generally speaking, like what my opponent is doing here is sensible on some level, but also, yeah, exactly. Like you, having played a4, you can't really castle queenside anymore. Because I will just play b5, I don't really care about sacrificing that pawn, I want the, the files open on the green side, so. Uh, my opponent postponing the castling for a number of moves kind of gave me the idea that maybe they wanted to... Um, they wanted to just castle green side anyway, but I don't think it would have worked.
Yeah, I mean, my experiences with the French are also like very, very seriously influenced by um, you know, the fact that for many years the only person I played the French against with White was Alexander Morozevich, who was a fabulous, fabulous French player. He was really good at that opening. He understood it inside and out, had a lot of very original ideas, and uh, was extremely difficult to play against. And uh, I, like, generally just did not enjoy those games at all. Um, so, yeah, that very much colors my my experiences. I think Orchnoy played the French against me once. And I think I won that game. But not really due to the opening. I think I played black against him much more than I played white. Uh, against Victor. Knight h5 is actually kind of an annoying threat here. I'm wondering if I'm supposed to do something about it. But, whoa, okay, that's just a misclick. Obviously, the, the rook is supposed to go through. Yeah, I will I will correct myself. I'm actually allowing rook a1 here, which is annoying, but manageable. Thank you, webmaster. What did he say after the game? I think that was the French. Hang on a second, I'm trying to... Yeah, it was definitely the French. It was some kind of a quiet 92a6 type of French. And... Uh, he just shook my hand and signed the score sheet and went went away immediately after the game. But then later that day, I saw him in an elevator, and he told me, uh, "Young man, you're a very superficial player, and I could have made a draw against you if I wanted to, but I wanted to beat you, so that's the only reason you beat me." And I kind of nodded because I think oh, every single word was true. So, like, why be upset? <clears throat> I'm kind of lucky here that rook f5 doesn't work uh, because queen takes d1. Okay, one more since there. It's it's still uh, it's still uh, five minutes to the hour. Uh, you're welcome, Elvis. I don't think it's he wasn't like salty. Doesn't really describe it. Although, actually, you know, I, he was so, f so much of a different age that it never really occurred to me that you could call, you could call all of that salt. But maybe it is a, a good description. He was famously very, very acerbic towards his opponents, in particular where he felt his opponents weren't, you know, up to his level. There are some absolutely legendary stories on that on that topic. The horse moves in a strange way because it's a. Uh, look at that horse. That horse is amazing, and it moves in amazing ways. I don't think he was a bad loser uh, necessarily. Um, uh, Eleven Zion, because he also uh, he was, you know, very much capable of saying of saying nice things to you, and uh, he was just unbelievably passionate about the game, and uh, also, you know, in marked difference to many other people. And once again, I will be using myself as an example because I, you know, I know it's true about myself and it will feel slightly different. Uh, you know, it will feel kind of weird to describe other people uh, in those terms. But I never really, you know, whether I play chess well or badly, it's not fueled by my attitude towards the person sitting opposite me. 
you know, it's fueled by how I feel on the day. It's fueled by how I feel about life in general, perhaps. Even though that's kind of tricky and I've played some of the best chess of my life uh, during a period where life was very, very bleak. Um, whereas with Victor, he very pronouncedly was fueling his competitive spirit by, you know, channeling sort of hatred for his opponents. <clears throat> hatred is maybe a strong word, but like, definitely dislike and a very, very strong desire to, you know, not just win a game of chess in, as a, some kind of an abstract, but a desire to crush his opposition and, you know, assert dominance and uh, things of that general nature. Uh, and that, I think, explains very much uh, in terms of his his behavior during and after games, because if this is what you're using for fuel, losing games of chess becomes much, much more personal. You, you're not going to find, you know, I'm not team let's hate Korchnoi. I've known him reasonably well, you know, considering there were generations and generations between us. I played for the same club as him for a number of years. We've had, you know, team dinners, we've had team meetings and all that. And he was an extremely interesting, smart, passionate man who absolutely adored the game of chess, lived for the game of chess. And, uh, yeah, you, I'm, I'm not going to be, you know, participating in the general Korchnoi bashing here. I know people have been, over the years, people have been very offended by things he has said to them, but, um, yeah, I, for me, it was definitely kind of a rite of passage. Uh, is if I've not, I just didn't want to, uh, open additional files. Basically, once, uh, the big mistake in this game, you, you really have to play B2B3 in this position. You cannot allow me to land a knight on C4 unopposed. It's just not going to end well for you. Uh, once again, kind of important not to blunder anything here, but I think I'm not blundering anything here if I just take on F4 and then just go uh, Rook F5. Once, I assume Knight G5 happens. Yeah, I, I sort of, I, I sort of took it as a badge of honor, honestly. I, I understand it sounds a little bit perverse, and there's definitely been some stories of him saying things, in particular to female players, when he started playing against strong female players, that he perhaps, you know, you would prefer for him not to say those things. But uh, you also have a choice of, you know, getting mortally offended by it or not. I do feel like that's often a choice. And uh, for me, it was a very easy choice to not get offended. Yeah, we have a lot of material advantage here. And also this, this pin, I think I win a full rook here. I don't think a, the king can go to a square where I cannot win a full rook because of queen c1 check in this specific position. So yeah, this one will be quite comfortably winning for me. And it will be the last game of, of the show. Uh, thank you very much for everybody tuning in. Um, as has been alluded to during the show, I will be, um, I will be doing commentary on the match for the entire match. So starting from tomorrow, most of us will be very busy either, you know, watching watching the match or working in some fashion on the match. So uh once again a little bit of a plug. Uh Gary himself with uh, with the help of uh Matthew Sadler who was a very, very strong player in his youth and then was one of the early people who took a very unusual decision to kind of quit while he was definitely ahead. I think he quit when he was rated like 26.50 and he and was still probably in the world top 50. Uh, and he went to work in a non-chess related field and then uh, 
uh, came back to chess and is is now I think rated higher than I am uh, currently. I think Matthew is rated twenty six ninety four, and I am no longer rated twenty six ninety four. I was at some point at exactly the same rating that his he was, but not anymore. Uh, and he's also a very knowledgeable, very knowledgeable uh, person, and has written a very interesting book on Alpha Zero and. Uh, the uh, kind of the progress that uh, chess engines are making these days. And his Twitter is, um, if you're interested in computer chess, following Matthew on Twitter is definitely a very, very nice first step. So Gary and Matthew will be doing uh, recaps daily, as I understand it, on uh, on the Kasparov Chess channel. So uh, do look out for those. They uh, They have to be fantastic like i i cannot imagine those recaps not being an absolute must watch uh just just can't can't possibly not be something you absolutely want to watch and uh you know despite actually uh commenting every kind of every moment of every game live i, I think i will be tempted to just tune in and watch them myself just to just to see what gary gary says about the game because you know talking about chess with gary is an absolute dream still for me and uh uh there he will be they day after day just providing his thoughts fresh after the game uh, once again thanks everybody for for watching thanks uh to, to arthur's nikshans for for the raid and uh there will be more streams but not i think until 2022 because i will be doing the match and then i will probably play in a couple of things myself uh yep cheers and uh i'll see you i'll see you when i see you